Hi, everyone. My name is Joe Kelly. I'm the program coordinator for the Rochester Hills Public Library, and I'm here to welcome you to tonight's program, Wildlife and People of Africa and the Falkland Islands, presented by veterinarian and wildlife photographer, Dr. Carl Palazzolo. Uh, <laughs> give a hand. Uh, just briefly before we get started, I just want to give a few notes. If you guys have cell phones, please be sure to turn them off or you know, quiet them so they're not going to make any disturbances during the program, if you could please. And uh, the program tonight will also be recorded. It will be available about one week from tonight if you want to share it with friends, family members, anybody who wasn't able to attend. And lastly, I'd just like to give a thank you to the friends of the Rochester Hills Public Library. Their, fundraising, their fundraising efforts make programs like tonight's possible, and we really appreciate their support. Without further ado, I would like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Carl Palazzolo. Thank you, Joseph. Just out of curiosity, how many people in this room have been to Africa before? One, two, three, four, amazing, huh, Rick? Okay, Nancy, Nancy you've been to Africa, huh? Oh, you have, huh? Okay, thank you, yeah. Fibber, okay, good. Yeah, same thing, okay, okay. All right, so it was 35 years ago this week that I first went to Africa, October of 1986, this week right now. I set up the whole trip via fax machine. Didn't meet the people on my trip till I got there. Didn't meet the guides till I got there. So that's how things operated back then. And here it is now, seven continents and 35 years later, and I'm still going back to Africa. So apparently I like the place. This is a photo from that first trip. Asked me of some Maasai children. By the way, in Africa, the average age of people under, I think, 25 is like 70% of the people there. It's a very young continent. And this is me at the Serengeti. I've always wanted to go there. The Serengeti is a famous place. Does anybody, by the way, speak Swahili here and know what the word Serengeti means? Okay, Tony Prano, what's it mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Okay. So <laughs> Serengeti is a Swahili word. It means extended landscape. So it's a great place to go, a lot of wildlife there. So in tonight's presentation, about the first one-third of it, we're going to bop around Africa a little bit, show a few photos in general, and then we're going to go ahead and end up in the country of South Africa for most of our presentation, working with rhinos. I've been to Africa 10 times, so I have lots of stories and lots of photos to share. In the next hour and maybe 15 minutes or so, I can't possibly cover all of them. So what we're going to do tonight is briefly take a trip to Kenya, Tanzania. We're going to see the gorillas in Rwanda. And we're also going to see some leopards in Zambia. Cheetah in Namibia, leopards in Botswana, rhino in Zimbabwe. But we're going to spend most of the trip later on in the country of South Africa at a place called Maritaba, which is a fantastic place. There's too much information tonight for me to cover all these trips, so if you're inclined to, and my business cards are up here for more information, if you go on the website of the Long Beach Animal Hospital, and the address is lbah.com, and click on the photography link, you can see much more than I can present in the next hour and 15 minutes or so. So this trip that I went on recently to South Africa revolved around this man. His name is Andre. He's a veterinarian. We set this trip up purposely to be with him, and I took some other veterinarians to him. This man is also one of the kind of people that restores your faith in humanity. He believes in what he does. He's competent, he's a great leader, and he's got a good sense of humor. So later on in this presentation, you're going to see and hear Andre talk quite a bit. It's going to revolve around poaching rhinos. But you'll learn much more about that later on. And basically, rhino poaching is occurring extensively, and most of it's from Asia. Most of it's from the Chinese and the Vietnamese. They think it's medicine that helps them, whether it cures cancer or other medicinals, and it doesn't work, but it's ancient. Chinese medicine that's not going to change, and Andre talks about that more. So Andre has a tough job. He's got to try and keep these rhinos alive for tourism, which is very important, and also because it's an iconic species, and we don't want it to go extinct. So this is Andre when we first met him. It was a quick, hurry up, he's here, get your iPhone, film him in the kitchen, and he's going to talk about his job, his responsibility. He's going to talk about the fact that Kruger National Park, a big park in the area, has got trouble. He's going to talk about, he's going to try and make it so a live rhino is worth more than a dead rhino. Because right now, 
90% of rhinos get poached. So we're going to listen to him talk for three seconds. And I think in a current environment, um, we are also home to the biggest white rhino population in a national park outside of the Blue Bear, which not only is a challenge, it's also a massive, massive responsibility at the moment. So, and we'd really love to share some of that with you in the week coming. Um, and I think quite a bit of what we'll do over the next few days will be rhino focused. Um, <clears throat> because we're doing a lot of stuff. <laughs> so poaching pressure is enormous inside of here. I'm not sure how many of you are up to date with what's going on. But we've, we've lost more than 10,000 rhinos in the last decade to poaching. And in a population of, of an animal that is has got such a long life cycle, it's catastrophic. So we've been in a decline since 2015. Um, and if you look at places like Kruger National Park, or actually most state-owned land, uh, the current statistic is that a rhino on state-owned land has got a 90% higher chance of being poached on private land. Oh and, and we can attest to that, because we fall into the combination of, of those properties, and we've, we've had poaching, uh, but we've been very, very lucky that it's been a low-intensity low poaching. Uh, and we've got an amazing community effort uh, with all our surrounding farms and our government partners. But I think importantly, we're testing ground for a whole lot of um, tech solutions to the poaching problem. So we've got a very new, novel um, tracking and, and alert system that we're deploying on the rhino. It's a solar powered foot collar. And we use foot collars because their anatomy just doesn't warrant it, and they follow like many other species. Uh, and for the first time, we've actually managed to get a, a successful solar powered collar. <clears throat> they last anywhere from three to five years. And it's all based on what they call a LoRa network, which is a low range radio frequency that transmits minuscule little packages of data bytes to a series of towers that we've installed across the property, which we'll show you as well. <clears throat> this feeds into a real lifetime property management system that is actually uh, was developed and funded by the Paul Allen Foundation, which is now made freely available to all big conservation organisations in Africa and and abroad. So these data packages feed into that. We get it real time on the screen where you can see where each and every rhino is. Uh, two or three times a day, but importantly, the difference between this system and all the other ones is that in the event that there's a poaching incident and the rhino displays this particular set of behavior, which we've now tracked over the last five years, I immediately and the rest of our, our law enforcement team receive alerts on our phones uh, and we can actually deploy our range of force to a GPS coordinate rather than having them trying to patrol the massive area blindly with the idea that you can catch the buggers on site. What, what is the punishment for a poacher, especially depending on the animal? You know, it's, it's, it's really challenging because there have been some tremendously good sentences in the last five years. But to, to convict someone of poaching, you need to have all the puzzle pieces together. So you need the suspects on site with the weapon, with the ballistics, with the DNA of the animal, uh, and that's challenging on its own. What we're doing now enhances that prob probability of getting that all together. Um, but the reality is that most of them end up being convicted on some series of misdemeanors, like illegal possession of a firearm, or trespassing. You're allowed to shoot on sight? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it's happening on a daily basis. Uh, and, and the real picture in Kruger is it's a full on war. So they're currently experiencing more than seven up to 15 incursions a day. So it's, it's a full scale war. But the reality in Southern Africa, where 50% of our country is unemployed, 60% uh, of the country live below the bread line of $2 a day. Um, when you get offered three or four times your annual salary just to provide information, 
um, you can shoot as many as you like. There's a consistent way you can swallow. So we've got to think a little bit outside the box, and these are all things we'll talk about in the week. You know? uh, that law enforcement is not the only, uh, it, it's, it can't solve the problem on its own. It's, it's fact, it's published, it's scientific, it's determined. So we need other modalities that are going to assist us in getting to and the reality for us is we've got to turn the table so much so that a live rhino is worth more than a dead one. So we're going to come back to Andre a little bit later on in the presentation. First, let's have a little more fun, nothing so heavy. So the guys in Africa are fantastic. They always have a smile on their face. They're very competent and friendly people. These are two of my recent trips, having fun. Anybody know why I like this guide as my favorite guide? Anybody tell? Can you see his name? Okay, so he's my favorite guy. So I've taken a lot of groups there over the years, many hundreds of people. Some to learn conservation medicine, some to learn wildlife photography. This is one of the younger groups. Let's just say they were more of a party group. And here they are on their little booze cruise. The Mara is a river in the area. And then one night they played a game called Ibble Dibble. Well, it's a drinking game where you make a fool out of yourself. As you can see from the next photo, John felt no pain the next day. Okay? A little too much Ibble Dibble that night. So a lot of fun people. This is an important picture. This is my group, same group you just saw, with one of the people that runs the camp, and she runs the camp. And so the guide said to us, it's your last morning. The plane's not going to come and get you till about noon, so if you want to sleep in, go ahead. Or if you want to go ahead and do another game drive, we'll get up at 5 o'clock and go out there. Well, these game drives are grueling, and people said, oh, let's just sleep in. My feeling is sleeping on the plane home, okay? Because two smart people, Sean and yours truly, stayed up, we got up early, and we saw a baby being born in front of us. This is a topi. You can see the head and the two front paws. You can see its face now. You see the eyes, the nose, and the one front paw. And he was born right in front of us, kerplunk. Right. And the first thing he saw was us. Okay, he looked at us. And then his mom cleaned him up, and he spent the next two minutes just sitting there. And then what's most unbelievable about these animals is he spent the next five minutes up and down, up and down, and 30 minutes later, he was walking at normal. They take off in no time because the predators can get them. So those people that slept in miss this. So the bottom line, if you ever go on these once-in-a-lifetime trips, get out there. You'll sleep later on when you get home. Okay. okay, let's do a few general pictures of some of the wildlife we've seen around the area. We'll start with, well, we can't do wildlife photography until you find the wildlife. So class, does anybody see any wildlife in this photo? If you do, don't say anything. Let your neighbor figure it out. Okay? I'll give you a little bit of a clue. It could be in the grass. It could be in the bushes. It could be in the trees. It could be behind the car. So let's take this photo, cut it in half, and look at the right half of the photo. Now do you see the animal in it? Maybe there isn't one. Okay? Let's go a little closer in that tree in the center. Now do you see it? What is it? It's a leopard, yeah. So that's what they look like. So let's do a few leopard shots. This is in Kenya. This is a beautiful one with the tail sticking out. This is also in Tanzania. Okay. A beautiful one walked right past us, right in front of our car. We'd almost touch it. This is in Botswana. It's a beautiful female that posed for us. Mm -hmm. Leopards are amazing animals because the other animals, like hyenas and lions, can take their prey when they kill it. So what do they do? They bring it into a tree. So think about that, putting something in your mouth and climbing a straight up a tree with that. They must have very powerful neck muscles and powerful jaws. So this is a female bringing up a half-eaten gazelle, and there she is up the tree. It's amazing what they can do. Another male, this time it's a male in a different area, he brought up a 200-pound gazelle into the tree. So it's just amazing animals what they can do. Okay, leopards are done. Next, do you see any wildlife in this photo? I'll give you a little clue. This one's harder to find. It's in the very center. It's a lioness. She's sitting on the mount. So since we're on the lions now, let's look at some lions. This is in the Serengeti. Okay. Two young males. They're going to form a coalition to become big males later on and take over the pride. Mm -hmm. Two lionesses getting ready to hunt. Mm -hmm. And yes, they do hunt. It took me five trips to Africa to see this. This lioness is attacking a wildebeest. And that's what they do. They have cubs to feed, so they got to eat also, too. As you see, nature is raw. And there's the cubs. A lot of grooming, a lot of playing with clubs. 
playing with cubs. All right, so now we're on the giraffe. Does everybody see the giraffe in the center of the photo? Okay, so now we're going to make it easier for you. Now do you see it? It's a tree trunk, okay? So those that saw a giraffe, that's a giraffe, okay? So when giraffes are sitting still, they're called a tower. When they are moving, they're called a journey. It's a funny name for them. And on occasion, you might see a three-headed giraffe. They occur. Mm -hmm. So giraffes do a lot of necking for whose control of which male is going to be the dominant one. And there's some interesting physiology on giraffe. First off, when they drink, they're quite vulnerable. So they take their time checking the area out to see if there's anything around to eat them before they take a drink. But also to get that blood to the top of their head, they have blood pressure that's twice as high as ours. It's 240 millimeters of mercury, which means then when they put their head down, all that blood's going to rush to their brain. And for us, that could be tra traumatic, catastrophic. They have special valves in areas of their body that can prevent that from causing a stroke or a burst of the blood vessels. So a lot of anatomy and physiology over many decades of evolution there. Okay, instead of finding wildlife, this time why don't you count the wildlife? These are called common zebra, also known as virtual zebra. Another kind in Africa is called the grabis. Do you see? How many do you see in here, I should say? Okay. Five, six. When you get to eight, you can stop, okay? There's eight of them. Let's count them. One, two, nostril number three, four, nostril number five, nostril number six, number seven, and ears of one lung this way, number eight. Okay? Good job, class. You're wildlife photographers now. Okay, let's go off to the gorillas. This was a fantastic trip, and the guy does nothing short of outstanding. This is Dr. Picaro, who works for me one of my clients, and this is Dominic. Remember Dominic, you'll see him later on in this presentation. He's a great guy. So when you first get there, these young kids put on this gorilla dance, it's super cute. It goes on for about 45 minutes. They jump up and out, I'm gonna play you the last couple seconds of it where he says, welcome in English. So here it is. So that's the start of the gorilla trip. It's a wonderful trip for people that are outstanding. This man on the right is named Francois. He was a porter for Diane Fossey, the famous gorilla researcher. So he knows his stuff, to put it mildly. They know everything about gorillas. Their life is nothing but gorillas. So him and Dominic are pretending they're silverbacks. They're bonding, okay? Getting ready to have a good time. Anybody know what this is as we're walking up to the fields and to the mountains on the top where the gorillas are? Does anybody know what this stuff is? It's a potato field. It's a liquid potatoes, yeah. Okay, so Francois is going to tell us how he makes three different sounds to keep the silverback calm. He's going to do this, give an example, then he's going to go beat his chest like the silverback, go bite a branch, but he's going to make Dominic do it too. It's hilarious, so watch what he does. He makes these sounds, more with the gorilla too, by the way. The happy sound. This is hello. This is He's quite the character, as you see. As you can see, Dominic's the entertainment on most of my trips. Okay? He comes along on most every one of them, so now let's go find some gorillas. We're walking up, you can see Francois on the lead, me right behind him. And the first thing I saw was a gorilla hand. Isn't it eerie to see that? Just sitting there looking at me. Mm -hmm. And then we came across a troop. Then we came across a large silverback with his troop with Francois right there making his gorilla sounds. Mm -hmm. 
and different silverback walked right in front of us. And then he stood there, and what he's doing is keeping an eye on us. He's pretending he's eating, but he's watching us carefully. And Francois is making all those sounds right now, keeping him calm. And this gorilla has seen Francois before, so he's very habituated, which makes it great for us. And so we had a 10 feet away from us, this 300 pound silverback just looking right at us. Just like that. Mm -hmm. So, silly me, I'm filming with a little point and shoot camera. They have a really wide angle lens, so you can't tell distance. So I thought the silverback walking towards me was far away. Well, he almost bumps into me. And if you listen carefully, you'll hear Francois say, move, move, because I wasn't paying attention. You'll see the whole film shake because I was stepping back into a hole. So listen carefully. In other words, he would have bumped into me if I hadn't moved. So me and this silverback almost shook hands. So they call him the boss. That's the name of that gorilla. All right, so we're going to see some other gorillas now. We're going to see some babies. And you can get really close, which is not good. Because what happens is some of them get human viruses and die. So they have a rule you're supposed to stay like 21 feet away, but it's hard not to get close to these babies when they're right there. So we see the gorillas. Couple days, I go back to the town called Kigali, and my partner sent me this email. Guess what? Near where you were, there were some twins born. Well, we did better than this. Francois knew about them, that's her. He coaxed her to come out, and there's two day old twin gorillas right there. So we got the photo, all because of Francois. Okay, now that you've found wildlife and counted wildlife, and you're such great wildlife photographers, now see if you can identify eyes. First off, animals have a structure in the back of their eye that we don't have called the tapetum lucidum, which allows them to reflect the light. So that's what you're seeing right now. So can you guess what kind of animal this is from the eyes? Any guesses? Lion, very good guess. Not quite, very good. Anybody else? Cheetah, you win the prize, okay? So let's look at some cheetah now. Mm -hmm. Cheetah in the Serengeti. Cheetah, it's all about the eyes, the beautiful eyes. This is early morning Serengeti, another morning Serengeti cheetah. A mother looking at us, because we were near her cubs, and that was her cub right in front of us. A couple yearlings. Mm -hmm. So cheetah have to eat and hunt every day. The other predators, if they catch a big wildebeest like the lions, they can eat every three, four days, but they got to eat every day. So we're going to talk about cheetah hunting here. Okay? And they do hunt, and they are successful. And they have to eat with no hands. They eat with just their mouths. I'm going to give you a short video of how they eat. And that's a guy talking Swahili in the background. Mm. So this is all in the Serengeti area. Now, the cubs are not born with the innate ability to hunt. So the mother has to teach them. It's phenomenal. What she does, she walks through the grass of the Serengeti. She's looking for something. And she knows what she's looking for. It's a baby Thompson gazelle hidden in the grass. She finds him and she doesn't kill it. She stuns it on the back of the neck, bites it there, and lets her cubs practice hunting it. I have like 500 photos of this, where the cubs are hunting down a baby so they can learn how to hunt and survive. And there they are right there. And the mother came in and after about 30 minutes, she kills it because the commotion attracts hyenas and lions, and they will take the prey from them. So they work hard to get it. So right away, she kills it, and they have lunch that day. Mm -hmm. Another time, different cheetah, young male, very aggressive. That's a one-day-old wildebeest he's hunting down. So they got to learn how to hunt. And if they don't, they will die. There's no Trader Joe's over there for them. There's no Kroger. So they got to survive. Mm -hmm. So in Namibia, they have a place called the Cheetah Conservation Fund. It has the greatest number of cheetah in the world in Namibia, and this grape group has the most amount of cheetah genetics in the world. Cheetah are very endangered because they're inbred, so they're trying to help them quite a bit. And also what happens in this part of the world, there's a lot of dairy farmers. And goats are easy pickings for cheetah. So the dairy farmers kill the cheetah. So this woman named Lori Marker had this innovative idea that's working very well. She heard about these dogs called Anatolian Shepherds. They're very protective dogs. So she got them as puppies, raised them with the goats, and now they bonded. 
And I'll read what it says here. Predators, including cheetahs, leopards, jackals, baboons, and even humans are scared away by my barking. I will attack if necessary. It's working. So all the farmers that are goat farmers there want one of these dogs because if they lose two, three goats, they're out of business. These are not industrial strength corporations. So they've got innovative ways to take care of things in Africa that's pretty fascinating. Okay, how fast can a cheetah run? 90, nope. 70, 60, 60 is realistic. It's 60 miles per hour is what they can run. So they have several adaptations to allow this, and later on in the presentation, we're going to sedate a cheetah, and the vet's going to talk about some of these. But let's look at some right now. In relation to their body size, big nostrils, big windpipe, big trachea, big heart, they're thin, light body. They have skin that here is tight to their body like a swimmer that wears that cap to keep things tight. They have a tail that can kind of go anywhere for turning and stopping, but there's something else that people don't know about. See how the back legs are coming forward and you see the claws sticking out? They're one of the few cats that the claws do not retract. If you look carefully now, the back legs come way forward. Their spine really compresses. And then when they let loose, they stretch right out. That's a big part of their speed. And here's the real deal in the Serengeti. So they stretch out. So they compress and expand, compress and expand. We'll learn more about them in a minute. Okay, so we're done with the background. Now let's get on the current trip. I was just there a month ago. Now we're in South Africa, and this man, Alan, set up the trip for us, okay? He set up specifically for me to be with Andre, that wonderful veterinarian, and I brought some other vets with me in the group. So here's my group. Some of them are vets, some of them are friends and clients, and I call them the Motley Crew, okay? The Riff Raff is what they were. So they got in the way of my photography, but we had a ball. And so here is one of the people that owns this camp called Meritaba, thanking us for coming out. These people are gracious, sophisticated, and classy. They haven't had tourists there in a year and a half because of COVID. His name is Rob, and he's going to tell us about how thankful he is about us coming out to his Maritaba camp. It's, uh, it's great to be reconnecting relationships from all over the world, which we've been started off for the last 18 uh, months or so. And, and um, I mean, what's so important as well, just to just, to, just so you understand, for, for you to come out here and, and be confident enough, I don't want to use the word brave, because that may, but it is a bit of bravery and courageous, but um, it makes a difference because when you go back and you share your stories and, you know, we, we need to rebuild our industry, we need to rebuild um, confidence in travel and, uh, I mean, these amazing places couldn't survive. Um, they can't be sustained without visitors. Um, so it's just an absolute honor, and I'm massively appreciative under these situations that the world's under, that you made the journey, you've come out here, and um, I know Sean and Hugh will concur. It's amazing to hear your accents. <laughs> it's been a long time, you know? So welcome again. Um, and I hope my kids have been um, sort of, they'll be a bit rough on the edges, but sort of, so I wanted to expose them a little bit to, to what we do, that it's not all just um, uh, champagne and caviar. Uh, but again, welcome. Welcome on behalf of me, on behalf of Sean and Hugh and Alan, of course, um, here, and all the family here, and, and, uh, and uh, every South African our country. We're delighted to have you visiting our country. Okay. They think we have accents, okay? And when they say, can you come here, it's, can you come here? So we were teasing them quite a bit. So people ask often, how many shots do you have to give? What kind of drugs you got to do? We got no injections, no vaccines, no shots, and we took no malaria medication, and we drank the water from the faucets. These people are sophisticated. In this area called Maritaba, there's 33 lodges for tourists. They have their own water purification plant. So they know what to do to take care of us when we go out there. This is where we stayed. It's a beautiful location. Okay, the people there are always friendly, out your beck and call all the time. Okay, the guides and the chefs would get up at 3 o'clock in the morning because we would go out around 6, we meet them at 5, and they make homemade muffins for us every morning with coffee and tea. And after we came back from our game drive, we would find this on our bed from the maid who made our bed. And the food is gourmet food. They fed us like every two hours. You're going to gain weight in these trips, and they know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Lunchtime, we hang out by the pool, take a nap, eat lunch there, more food. Mm -hmm. Nighttime was dinners outdoors under candlelight. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they'd be driving around out in the bush, and they'd come around the corner, and they'd wait in their house for drinks. they call them sundowners. Mm -hmm. And one time they fooled us. The guys go, we got to go. 
we see some baby lions we got on the radio. These baby lions who come around the corner. They brought all the tables, all the cooking stuff. We have what's called a braai, a barbecue outside, and that's it right there. And here are the people cooking it for us. Always friendly, always happy. And the skies there are phenomenal. We saw Venus, Jupiter, and Mars every night. And they know their astronomy, so it's fantastic to see that. Mm -hmm. Then there's the guides. These are Hugh, go, call Hugh and Sean. They are characters. So they want to meet some American women. We're going to show you that in a second. But first, when they go out in the bush, they know what they're doing. They drive the car. And then he stops and goes, he sees tracks. He's going to explain the tracks. It was a lioness with a cub. You know it's a female? Say again? You said it's she. You know it's a female? Uh, I can see by the track size it's a female. Uh, there's a little bit of uh, little bit cubs behind, so we know there's a female with cubs inside. Uh, and males with these big tracks and little people walking singly right down the road. Yeah. So you see how open the vehicle is. You're right there with all the animals, and they know how to read them, and they know how to find them. They know the area very well, and it works out quite good. So let's have some fun with these guys. Okay, they took us on a little riverboat cruise one time with another guide. This is when we had a conversation about meeting American women. So you're going to see a cute little video. It's a goofy, fun one, but it's funny how they talk. Just listen to them. So I told him, that's not going to work, okay? We have to be a little more sophisticated than that. So seven takes later, at the hotel that night, we finally figured it out, okay? And they did it. They were laughing the whole time, but they eventually did good. Mm. Good evening from South Africa. Mm. My name is Hugh. My name is Sean. And we are field guides in Maritava, South Africa. And we would love you to enjoy and experience the safari life that we have up to offer, as well as all the local South African slang. Like early in the morning when we're greeting you, how's it? Well, if everything is good, we say lacquer. But if everything is perfect, 100%. So we thank you, and we hope to see you soon. So if you know any single women that want to meet them, let me know, okay? I've got their emails. <laughs> they're so much fun, these guys, and they're so knowledgeable in what they do. There they are, my final goodbye with them. Okay, New Camp, Madikwe, in the same general area. This is my guy, Nick, Nickelodeon, we call him. These guys, again, are fantastic. And it's interesting because in most spots in Africa, when I'm in a vehicle or walking, we'll talk about Zimbabwe and Botswana, Namibia, you walk out there with the guys, there's no guns allowed. Here the guns are mandatory. So each country is a little bit different. Show sure nothing, by the way, do you see the name of our car? The Green Hornet. We call it our car the Green Hornet. <laughs> so we talked about, about slang. They taught me their slang about how is it and locker and stuff. And one day I made a mistake. When they said something, I go, what's up? Big mistake, okay? They went online, they found that Super Bowl advertisement where the guys are going, what's up, what's up? I created a monster, okay? So they wanted to have a contest, and here they are with their contest of who says the best what's up. So the guys have taught me some South African slang. How's it? Lekka and 100%, so they're going to learn some American slang. Just now? No, just no. now. Just now, yeah. And, uh, Five minutes and three hours. Right, and later, dude. Later, dude. And catch you later, and copy later, and all those things, okay? So teach us now how to say wasa. Wasa! 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 And the winner is to be decided. <laughs> I created a monster. Every day I heard that all day long. Okay, not stop. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we don't have time to do all the animals there. This elephant's giving a dust bath. Mm hmm. One day on the airport, Bush Airport, they had a lioness. They said, hang around here. Let's see what happens. And next thing, the cubs came out, and we have hundreds of photos of them playing in front of us. What's interesting for us is, as we sat there taking these photos, an airplane started taking off at the end of the runway. Here it comes by, and you can see them looking at the airplane. Isn't that amazing? Uh -huh. And off it went. Our final line for that part of the day. So now we work with a man named Craig. They're going to sedate a cheetah. This female cheetah has a radio collar that's not working anymore. They need it no more because they have all the data they need. So you're going to see how a cheetah is sedated with a different veterinarian, not Andre. Here's Craig in charge of the group. 
And there she is with her collar, with three cubs. Different view of her looking at us. Okay, and there she is darted. You can see the radio, the dart right there, part of it. And then the veterinarian is going to take the dart out and cover her eyes. There she is ready to go. My photo with her. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to see the whole darting process, how they do it. And there she is running right there, okay? So now we got to go find her. Her cubs are going to stay with her, but she's going to hide from us. But they know how to find her. Mm -hmm. And they have to give her more juice, too. The first dart didn't quite do the job. So look really carefully. We're trying to see her. In a second, you're going to see the one cub there. You'll see the cub come across right here in a second. See her right there? So we're keeping track of the cubs to find the mother. He's got to give her more juice, more anesthetic. It wasn't quite enough. And he does. And now we're tracing her with the radio collar. And there she is right there in the center. So they're taking the collar off. It's on pretty hard. It's hard to get off. And it's non-functional. She's got a bad tooth right here, but it's not bothering her, so we're going to leave it alone. See, it's cracked, upper left canine tooth. Hook to get their prey. Normal nails, but your, the pads is quite hard. If you compare it to a cat, a cat's uh, pads is quite soft. These ones are hard like a dog. So. And if you look at the whole overall condition, they've got a very tight skin, so all from side to side. Tight, tight skin. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing is they use their toe to steer them as well, so and to help them to break. So and everything happens at when the a large speed with these guys. So this also you can see I pronounced this yeah. so under high speed and just to stop this as X is a break. That's called the carpal pen. Mm -hmm. And they give some vitamins and some other things and they wake her up then, so so that was successful. So now we're going to start getting ourselves more towards the rhinoceros part of our presentation. If this will work. There we go. This is my riffraff group. I'm finally rid of them because I'm going to have one assistant photographer come. So I'm saying goodbye. Thank God. They were obnoxious, okay? Time to get rid of them. So now I'm going to be able to get some better photography in because I have an assistant. You're going to meet her in a second. So it's just Nick and I and my assistant. Okay, and my assistant has a job, several jobs actually. The first part of her job is when I'm with this big lens camera, I can't see much around me. It's got a very limited field of view. And so her job is to scan with the binoculars. Well, she took her job real serious. One morning, early morning out there in this car, she's scanning like crazy, as you can see, helping me quite a bit, okay? And then her job after that, we go back to the, the room and she's got to charge batteries. We have them ready for the afternoon. And again, you can see she takes her work seriously, okay, charging the batteries. Then at the end of the day, she has to go ahead and make sure we download all the photos. So here she is preparing for the downloading of the photos, okay? So she was a ball. We had a good time. She's a tech at an animal hospital. Worked out really well. And then Nick was working hard many days, too. Of course, when the Skittles came out, everything came to a halt, okay? So these people are fun characters. And there's something else on these trips. It's like one of these immutable laws of nature. I call it the law of conservation of packing. No matter how well you're close fit in going to the trip, when you come back home, they never seem to fit into your luggage, okay? So it's gonna happen to you on a trip like this. Okay, let's go ahead now and get a little more serious about the game viewing with Nick and how classy they are. So in this area of the world, in South Africa, 
They don't let a million people come and look at these animals. If they see maybe a cheetah or a leopard in a tree, you go to the Serengeti, for example, there might be 10, 15, 20 cars there. Here, free maximum. And they ask permission to join the group. It's really nice. They're gentlemen, so they make it a good experience for the people and the animals. So Nick, he's going to say, hi, I'm Nick Nickelodeon. He's going to explain what they do. My name is Nick uh, Nickelodeon. We're from the Nickelodeon Sport Lodge in South Africa. Uh, and we have a philosophy here with game viewing. So we try and limit the impact on the animals. So when we are sitting with them, we only allow three vehicles to sit with them at a time. Rather than in other parts of the world where you have 20, 25 vehicles sitting with the animal at a time, puts a lot of pressure on that animal. And also not as comfortable for those who are watching or viewing the animal at the same time. So you get an idea that it's a really great place to go game watching because these men are classy and if there's three vehicles, the next vehicle goes, do I have permission to join you? And one person leaves, they say yes. So they're all gentlemen all the way. I'm an action photographer, a couple of shots, that's Impala flying by. Okay, these are male lions that are a part of a pride. They're buddy-buddy, as you can see, they sleep together. And what I find fascinating about them is all of a sudden, they'll jump up. We don't know what they're perceiving, whether they're seeing something, hearing something, or smelling something, we can't even tell. And then he'll give it a growl, and then they'll go back to sleep together again, too. So they're just fascinating to watch, even when they're sitting there, okay? And they do hunt. That's a young male with the wildebeest, and they use their rough tongue to scrape the meat off the bones. They're doing that right there. Okay, they made quite a bit. They go out for three, four days, made all the time. It's a mating pair, okay? Our last lion photo of this trip. Mm -hmm. Now, let's talk about rhinos for the rest of the trip. What kind of rhino is this? 50-50 chance, black or, I mean, black or white, which one? It's a white rhino, how can you tell? Because the lip is straight across, so white, white is Afrikaans or German word for white, so this is the white rhino. It's called a perisiodactyl, uneven toed ungling. It's got three toes, and here is your black rhino. You can see the difference with the lip now. The white rhino is a grazer, it eats grass. The black rhino is a browser, it eats branches. They have tremendous sense of smell, tremendous hearing, and extremely poor eyesight. Of the two, the white rhino is larger, but the black rhino is a little more cantankerous, and on occasion, they have this attitude of charge first and ask questions later, because they can't see you. So the guys know how to work with them. So many people go to Africa and don't even see rhinos. It's amazing to me, okay? So our first day out with the guys, we saw three. Uh, correct that, we saw four. Matter of fact, we saw seven, okay? All on one game drive. It's amazing how many rhinos are there. We saw the mother and the calf at the water hole with the reflection, a male coming toward us at the same water hole, a big male with a female and a calf. Look closely on his skin now. Do you see how rough their skin is? You get a feel for the skin? Mm -hmm. You see the eyes? Notice anything else on this guy, right about right here? That's a bird. That bird is an ox pecker. He eats ticks off of him. In this case, he's cleaning out a wound that this guy had. So they help each other quite a bit. At night, we go out shining at night, and we see the rhinos at night. So a lot of rhino activity in this area. It's my, not my first time with rhinoceros. 1994 in Zimbabwe, working with the park rangers, all we saw were footprints. And one day we got lucky, we found three rhinos. This man is a park ranger at Wangi National Park. Anybody ever hear of that lion Cecil and Wangi that got killed? Anybody familiar with that? Okay, this is that area then. So he's a park ranger. And at the time, I think it's still this way, he has license to shoot poachers on sight. They execute him. In his hands, he's got an AK-47. It's terrible for animals. He used it to kill poachers. So he was so thrilled that we saw three live rhino back in 1994. It shows how bad the problem has been. That same place, they had a radio collared rhino, and there she is, radio collared. The radio collar, and you can see the horns are cut off now. So we're going to talk about that in a second. So when a rhino comes near you on the ground, what do you do? You go into a tree, okay, and get out of the way. And I had a chance to photograph it right below my feet, right there. So let's learn about now what this cutting of the horns actually does from Andre. Can you do a five minute summary on the rhino horns cutting it off, how successful or unsuccessful that has been over the years? Uh, I think uh, when one goes back to the initial poaching scourge of the 80s, um, it wasn't as successful as one would have imagined in places like um, Zimbabwe, where they, they were poaching rhino in massive areas. So for the poacher to receive his reward, he did not want to waste his time following up a dehorned animal, so they would kill them in any case. In South Africa, the context is completely different because we have 
intensively managed fenced areas with lots of human activity. Uh, the risk reward ratio balance has changed dramatically here, so the poachers would much rather poach on a property where they're horned animals than dehorned animals. So all of the properties that I know of that have got dehorned animals have a much lower incidence of poaching than properties that have horned animals. And that includes ourselves. So we have made a decision that we want to retain a horned population for as long as physically possible under the current pressure. We've set a threshold of concern, and if we lose X amount of animals in an animal, I mean, we don't ever want to use the term acceptable mortality, but I think it's a reality now. But above that mortality rate, then we will we'll dehorn the entire population. I feel very strongly that it's an all or nothing intervention. Because in a free roaming population, if you only dehorn certain individuals, you're immediately putting them at a social disadvantage, which is just simply not correct. So we've taken an all or nothing stance. And as long as we can maintain the current tempo, which at the moment for us is zero, um, we have to keep it if we escalate to five animals a year or ten animals a year, then we will dehorn our population. So there are some parks. Kruger is dehorning on mass at the moment. Pilansburg, uh, which is just down the drag here, they dehorned every single runner in the park. Mm. Is it working? It's working. So they're, they're, they're poaching. Incidence has dropped dramatically, okay. but it doesn't, it does not change the overall level of poaching, it just displaces the activity to properties like ours. That's, that's, that's. So what he's saying is if they ever end up cutting off the horns in his area, they're going to cut off every rhino's horns. It's all or nothing for them. So a lot of poaching, just look at the year 2016, over a thousand rhinos were killed in this area. There's one good thing about the virus from last year, though, look at 2020, only 166 were killed. So there's some good points on some of the things in life. So, so what's going on with the rhinos? Pretty much China and Vietnam think it cures all kinds of things, and they'll do anything they can to get, get them over there, and they'll pay off all the people in Africa, the government officials, who turn their eye and said, yes, it's illegal, don't dare take a rhino out of our country, and they take the money. So it's a lot of corruption. And what happens is they come from Tanzania, Kenya, Zimbabwe, Mozambique, and South Africa. They go to a staging area, it's called a transit country, that's in blue here, somewhere near Hong Kong, and then from there, they go to Vietnam or they go to China. And that's their trade route. So he's gonna talk more about this for a second. You'll learn much more about it. I think the current reality, if you project the current rate of poaching, we, we do not have enough rhino left on the planet to sustain an effective campaign to kill the demand. So, one has to recognize that the demand is a socio-cultural belief that's 10,000 years old. And whether us as Westerners believe, and we're very critical of it, uh, it's... Um, it's a fictitious demand because it doesn't work as medicine. Well, is that relevant? How many of you, if you diagnose with a terminal disease tomorrow, uh, are going to lose your rationality about drug choice? If your mate tells you, if you wake up tomorrow morning and squirt bloody rhubarb juice in your eye, mm. you may well try it. Yeah. So I don't think that's a valid argument. Uh, the fact of the matter is that the Asian population believes that it works. There are over a thousand registered traditional Chinese medicines that contain the product. And we don't have enough money to sustain a campaign long enough to convince the whole of Asia that it's not worth it. At least not yet. Well, no, you say, I mean, I don't, and, and I'm not saying that because I don't think that we should, we should be not driving those campaigns. I think the long term goal should always be demand reduction. But I believe that working on only one end of the scale is a bit of a futile exercise. And it's nice to be able to talk to a bunch of veterinarians because if you convert it to what we do on a daily basis, if you had to look at it as a vaccination program, if 1% of the Asian population is a current day user, to make sure our rhinos survive into perpetuity means that we have to convince the remaining 99% of Asia never to try it. So, is that possible? <laughs> So you see, like every issue in life with human beings, it's complicated. 
And people over here just kill the poachers and you'll solve the problem. It's not that easy, is it? Mm. He's going to talk about what they're doing now about this. Currently in discussion with Dimension Data to support a lot of the tech development. So the infrastructure rollout of the tower system for one and a half million hectares is a, is a massive project. It's about three million acres. It's going to cost in the region of 25 to 30 million rand. About two, million, two to three million dollars a year. Um, and all the drugs that cost to do every rhino in the district over the next three years. Uh, and, and various other members of the organization have contributed massive amount of personal effort and time. So, yes, we do. Uh, it's, and it's, it's, we'll have to get the link from you. Yeah, now. and it's starting to work, so, okay. which is really exciting. Yeah. You know, how do the poachers kill the rhino and how do they cut off the heart? They, they're as high tech as we are. I mean, so what you need to understand is, I mean, to be one step ahead of these guys is a challenge. Okay? So they all have access to cell phones. They all have access to Google Earth. It doesn't take rocket science to look at Google Earth and say, well, there's a water hole. We know that property's got rhino. At some point in time, the rhino are going to drink it. Our best opportunity is full moon. Mm. So they'll come in and, and very often they will scout your property from, a, from an adjacent property for weeks at a time. They'll check your people movement, they'll know when there's uh, empty time and they'll come in and even if they have to wait for two or three minutes, they'll wait there until they get their job. If they're all equipped with uh, lots of illegal stolen hunting rifles with silencers and the difference now to what it was five years ago, uh, a couple of years ago they came in in small teams of ones and twos. They now come in with groups of four to six, and they're armed and ready for a contact at the same time. Wow. So it's a full-scale war out there. So they have, they have a shooter. They have someone who's proficient at removing the horn. Uh, they have two or three scouts, and they have a driver that picks them up and drops them off. What so, do you do when you detect um, a group of poachers, or what would you do? Who so would you contact? We've them? got to the point where we, we, we no longer are they interested or equipped to chase or pursue them? Right. And because of the system that we've got in place where we can see everything live time, when we get an alert from a collar, we deploy an internal team to that GPS site. The first thing that they do is look for tracks. If they find tracks of people heading in the direction, we shut down the whole area. So we've got a full-time 24-hour available reaction team that's comprised of local community members. Um, and we have, you know, sort of in every 500,000 hectares, there's a group of 20 or 30 guys that are well trained and operate. And we deploy them to every major road and they just shut the whole area down and we wait for them. Yeah. At some point in time, they've got to get up. Yeah. When so, you encounter them, um, I'm sure that's dangerous. Do you have an armed response from anywhere? Yeah, so there's two types of encounters. One is when the guys are already fleeing, they know they're at risk and they know they're going to get. And there's a possibility of them getting caught. So what usually happens then is that they dump their equipment, their firearm, their horn, whatever, in various locations on the route out. You get them, they empty handed, and then you've got to go through that process of getting them locked up for a misdemeanor. If you hit them red handed, it inevitably ends up in an exchange of fire. Yeah. Yeah. How do they cut the horn off? Various methods. I mean, they change arms in different syndicates. Some use a chainsaw and they butcher the poor rhino. Many rhino have survived it. So, badly shot, stunned, face cut off. Tomorrow morning he's awake and he's got this giant big cavity into his sinus. Um, have you been able to save those guys up there? We have actually, remarkably. So, we've got one of our colleagues, Johan Marais, who's developed a an elephant hide plate that you screw onto the top of the sinuses and it heals over a period of about eight to nine months. Uh, and in fact, there's a ball down the road that was a bit of a He's in an intensive facility at the moment. He's being moved to a new reserve in November and we're sending two girlfriends for him. So that's, that's what he wants. Two nurses. <laughs> nurses. So his big project is to try and get a radio collar on every rhino in the area and they can monitor everything. That's going to cost them $2 million a year for the future. This is what he's talking about, what the poachers do to them right there. Okay, let's now watch how they sedate a rhinoceros. We're going to have three different rhinos over the next few minutes. 
different times. I couldn't exactly walk up and say, Andre, can you wait a second? I got to put the tripod here in the light. And you can, you can, you know, so this is all seat of the pants, do the best we can. It's a lot of fun. This is his team. The man on the right is an assistant veterinarian. Helicopter pilot is outstanding at what he does flying around. There's his dart gun. There's his drugs. He uses a drug called M99. It's 3,000 times more powerful than morphine. It's very dangerous because after they give an injection to the rhino, what remains in the hub of the syringe, if a person pokes themselves, they can go into respiratory arrest. So you can be very careful with these drugs. He also uses a drug to counteract that so they can breathe better, and he'll talk about that in a second. So you learn how they sedate them. He hangs out halfway like this while the pilot's flying around. Okay, now he's going to talk about it. He's going to spend a few minutes describing how they do all these things. It's fascinating because they're going to sedate a high-risk animal. When a rhino goes under anesthesia, their oxygen level goes very low. They're very risky to die. And he's so good at it, he never loses them. So he's going to talk a bit about how they do the whole process. It's fascinating. All right, also, we're going to try and find an unnotched animal this morning. So, which means no cuts in the ears. Uh, or no number identification in the, in the ear system. Um, ben, ben, should we bring your please? Ben's his son, who's in vet school. Um, and as I said last night, we busy deploying all of these high-tech collars, which is a little solar-powered unit, which talks to the LoRa network, uh, and then sends us information on locations twice a day, and at the same time gives us alerts to any abnormal behavior which could be associated with poaching. So part of our responsibility, again, we discussed this all last night, is that we, um, we have to be able to individually recognize every single rhino. They recognize every rhino in the area. When we, when we initially started using collars, they were all battery operated and GPS based. But the drain on the battery system is too great, so we weren't getting much longer than 12 months off a unit. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the belting that we used was a different material. But we started using them on, on hind limbs, and actually we lost quite a few rhino. So, oh, why? Um, and, and mostly females. And we couldn't really figure it out. And then eventually we sort of realized that the mating behavior is it's a prolonged effect. So they copulate for over an hour. And when they do that, and the male's climbing on the back, and when he gets up, he was often standing on the side of the belt and it would cut into the foot. And then you'd have an open wound and it would just aggravate and eventually the collar just sort of, you know, the foot would swell around the collar and you'd do the animal. So we've now moved them onto the front, uh, front feet. We've done, just in our area now, uh, over a couple of farms, probably 150 animals. Uh, no issues to date, other than one animal that got some slight abrasions. So we're now around the edge off a little bit as well. But I've now taken some off that have been on for five years and they, they still look great. So. Do you replace them? Uh, yeah, so as they go flat, uh, we'll replace. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, it's a prolonged effort. But you know what? It optimizes the human resources, which is the biggest cost. Um, and it makes their job more effective. So that's, that's what it's about. Sure. Yeah, so it's quite a snazzy little thing that's produced in China. Uh, surprise, surprise. Unit. Surprise, surprise. But the tech is all of a young electrical engineer from South Africa who actually developed the system for his uncle who was using sheep to do stock theft. And then they recognized that it had merits for the four hours. So, um, so we learn. Yeah. Hopefully one of these days we'll have something like this that, that if the rhino is poached and they get to it, it explodes. Yeah. Something like that. How is it powered? How is it powered? It's solar powered. So, and, and, and this is such an efficient solar panel that it needs five minutes of light on 5% of the surface area to function on a daily basis. So even if it gets caked in mud, uh, and that's the other thing that, we, that used to cause injuries was when the collar was on, um, initially we felt or thought that you would have to sort of put it on as tight as an old collar that you had around the neck of an animal. And with that being too tight, particularly in areas that have black cotton soil, it would cake inside the collar, and then that in its own would cause abrasion. But this heavy unit and being on loose, uh, it moves a lot. So the only thing that we do is check that it can't come over the first joint of the leg. It can move all the way up, so nothing can take on this at all. So it's, it's pretty, pretty foolproof. What's the material made of? It's just a really strong. 
not as a plastic. No, the belt. The, the, the belt's convertible. Okay, but you're doing yeah. it with the belt. Just a convertible. Yeah. Um, when you said the um, item explodes, when. No, no, we'd like it. He was all excited. Yeah, it's yeah. 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 I mean, there are some, some units, like on some of the carnivals that are more difficult to catch a second time, you can actually get a, a, a remote release collar. It's got a little, it actually has got a little explosive device that you can trigger remotely. Okay. Yeah, they use them on Cheetah. Yeah, they use them on Cheetah. And, they, and you can trigger it, then it pops, and the, and the collar falls off. Oh, the collar falls off. Yeah. Okay. For us, you know, we, yeah. Not necessarily. The other thing that we'll do now, and we've got Rexon and his team here, Part of the South African regulations are every time you work with a rhino, we collect a full set of DNA samples from it, which go to a national laboratory. So in the event of a horn being seized in the east or somewhere, you're able to trace it back to property, which just aids in getting a decent conviction. So, That's yeah. fair. That's yeah. Right. Yeah. So we'll dart an animal now, hopefully, if we find one. Uh, it takes about anywhere from, they're, they're normally standing by three and, three and a half minutes. Um, down by six or seven, and then once I'm happy that the animal is stabilized, then we'll get you all in, and we'll be busy with it for about 25, 30 minutes. I think we're a big crowd, so the only thing is just stay away from the front of the animal. Everyone on the sides and the back, because if, if it does happen to wake up, they will, they've only got a forward gear, so they'll go forward. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, once we're done, we reverse her, and they will get to he or she. They'll be up in a few minutes and gone, doing what they usually, usually do. So, yeah. Have you got a preferred spot you dart the rhino on? Yeah, so you go for thick muscle mass, so ideally on the ramp. This is, this is the dart. It's got a nasty needle. They've got one inch thick skin, so. And the, and the aim is to get it perpendicular to the skin, into as thick, deep muscle as possible, where there's lots of blood supply for absorption. Yeah. So, I mean, these are really clever little things. It's got a little plunger like an ordinary syringe, and behind that is a percussion cap that you'd get in a toy gun with a floating detonator behind it on the impact that hits the percussion cap, it explodes, and it pushes the drug. With the rhino too quickly on the move, which is almost a bit of a <coughs> Yeah, so very seldom the understanding. So actually, you're moving at the same speed as the rhino when you're not. So you don't have to leave. Shot. Yeah. Here's a good shot here. Who's the man putting the trigger? Well, if I miss, no, if you're, you're putting the trigger. Then it's the pilot's flight. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, luckily it's not a small target, it's a big target. Yeah. I mean, typically how close would you get with a chopper? Uh, 10, 15 meters. Yeah, sometimes it depends on the terrain. I mean, the areas where tall trees you're driving from 30, 40 meters. But you want to try and get closer, you can really position the dart well because they're notoriously bad anesthetic candidates. So if you don't get them down in your usual period of time, there's a whole heap of or cascade of events that goes wrong. So they get too hot. Uh, the oxygen levels are low, and, and the anesthetic, I mean, you, you will have all heard about COVID now and what COVID does to your, to your SPO2, your, your oxygen concentration. Rhinos and the anesthetic are never, never above 80, usually between 70 and 80 percent, which is really poor. And that's on, on a pulse oximeter. On blood gases, they're even lower, they're like 60 percent. So we partially revive them um, so that their breathing effort gets better. And if they're not really breathing well, we'll give some oxygen at the same time. Yeah. No. And is this the ideal terrain to find them in to dart them? In other words, you don't want them darted in high bush and stuff? Well, yeah, I mean, it's uh, white rhino are nice to work with because you can actually maneuver them within a couple of meters. So we want, I mean, I don't know about JJ, but <laughs> most pilots can get them on the road. <laughs> yes, yeah, you flew this morning as well. Nice job. Yeah, nice job. Black, black rhino, totally different ball game. You put the dart in, you close your eyes and hope for the best. They you know, do what they like, they go where they like, and inevitably you end up in a bloody a thorn thicket with lots of chainsaws just to get to the animal. So, yeah, white rhino, nice and easy. So, are we good to go? So, I wanted you to see that, to see the preparation and also. This is not something most people do on safari. So now we're going to watch them do some of this stuff. This rhino has been sedated. Here we are approaching it. The eyes are covered. 
You make sure the eyes are covered to minimize stimulation. Same with the ears to minimize sound stimulation. Andre with his team getting ready. Okay, putting a catheter in the vein in the ear. He's going to give his butorphanol, which is going to bring the animal lighter so he's got better oxygen saturation. He titrates the drugs to keep him down but light enough. It's quite a skill he has. Giving the butorphanol right there to lighten up the breathing. They check to see if there's any microchips in the neck and also in the horn. They write down everything. It's all quantified. Okay. This guy always had a smile on his face. He's the one that gives oxygen in the nostrils. Okay, this is the foot that they're going to put the radio collar on. They measure it to make sure it's the right size. They always measure the horn just for data. They write everything down, like I said. This is the microchip that's going to go in the neck. Here's the collar that's going to go on the ankle. And they bolt it on just like that with the power tool. Make sure it's loose. You can see it's loose. Again, they cut off the bolt with the bolt cutter. And they smooth it off with the little file. They don't want it grabbing onto anything. And there it is, ready to go. Mm -hmm. We take a blood sample, okay? Everything is documented, like I say. And this one, they wanted to do an ultrasound to see if it's pregnant, so they rolled it on its side. There it is, getting more oxygen. They're doing the ultrasound, and that is a pregnant rhino. Ultrasound, right there. Mm -hmm. Here I am taking the final photo for this rhino. Okay, different one here, okay, different time. Okay, sedated, mm -hmm. catheter in. And you can see them giving the oxygen, taking the blood sample, documenting everything. More putting the collars on, cutting with the bolts. So different rhino, different time. Same thing as before, but now they're going to put a microchip in the horn. That's the front horn. There's the hole. They get the number of the microchip, and they go ahead and they cover it up with this glue. It's called Carpenter's Coal Glue. It's suitable for use on general woodworking applications, leather, felt cloth, cardboard and paper, and rhinoceros horn. Okay? <laughs> and there it is covered up. Okay, this is the other horn. They're putting it in. He's just putting it in right now. You can't see it, but it's in there. They gloop it up and cover it up. Okay, and there it is covered up. Mm -hmm. This one also, they wanted to go ahead and do an ultrasound. And they wanted to see that it was pregnant, and sure enough, it is. So that's how they operate. They keep track of everything. So let's look at what they have here. This is one that's got a new collar. They got the microchip. So a lot of stuff going on there. So I'm going to go back. We've got to show a video of what he does. Right here, I think it's missing, okay, in the helicopter. I don't have that. So we're going to go ahead and now see what he does here at the end. So this is our group. And there they are collecting the information for the DNA. And then this is the DNA system they use. And now we're going to actually watch them in action. That's the microchip he's putting in the neck. He's writing down the microchip number to record. Filing it down. They're going to give a drug to reverse the M99 anesthetic. Different, different rhino now. This one we're going to check for pregnancy. I don't know. I have to check on it. One, two, three. Big one. One, two, three. Keep going, keep going. 
victory. <laughs> they want to ultrasound it. That's why they're flipping it over. And she's pregnant too. Different rhino now, third one. He's putting in the IV. He's giving the butorphanol to lighten it up so it can get more oxygen. Repositioning the head. He, he wasn't like the head position. Putting in the goop, I call it. He gave the anesthetic to wake it up, and you can see him walking away now. And that's how they do it. Now there's one video missing here, we've got to find it. It kind of botched up in the helicopter, if I can find that. And then we're done. Mm -hmm. See if I have it here. Of him flying in the helicopter. The female and the calf in front of it. Watch the dart's going to come right there in a second, right there. See it? Boom. It's darted right there. The pilot pulls away to give it room to breathe. And that scared it so much. Mm -hmm. They want to get it on the road so the support vehicle can access it easily. That's me right there taking photos. She's slowing down, that's the calf, so now it's time to get close. See her staggering a little bit? They're going to chase the calf away with the helicopter. So this is how they do it. That pilot has got a tremendous amount of skill. So at the end of our presentation tonight, what I really wanted to do was just show you something different. Instead of a bunch of animal photos, they can do it anything. And I've got tens of thousands. If you want to stay, I'll show you all of them, okay? No problem. But I wanted you to see something different tonight, something that they do over there. It's serious work to them and what us as veterinarians do behind the scenes. So with the sun setting over the Serengeti, my presentation is over. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody have any questions? Yes. Go ahead. How has climate change affected the areas of the African continent? 
She asked, how does climate change, how has it affected the climate, the area of Africa I've been to? I really can't answer that question. I don't know. I just know that when I started going there in 1986, it's hot, and it's still hot, okay? <laughs> Best I can tell you. <laughs> Real hot. Mm -hmm. 16 months, so it's well over a year. Thank you, Nancy. Yeah, Tony. Where do those cubs go when you're out, you know, when you shoot the dart at an animal? They go about 100 yards away, and they just sit there and watch. They don't want to protect them. No, they're too young. They don't know what they're doing. And the man that sedates him, Craig, he knows his stuff. He knows every cub, what they're going to do. He's done this before. He knows their behavior, so he won't do it if it's risky. Okay. They're very experienced. With it. This is their life. This is what they do for a living. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're going back there in 2023. I'm taking a group of veterinarians there, and other people are welcome to join us. I can ask Alan if there's room. So I got like five or six vets already going. They want to be a part of all this. Next time, we're going to bring a professional videography crew, because now we know what we're up against. And I talked with Andre about making that. He says, yes, next time we can be more cooperative. Now I know what you guys need to do, so we're going to make it so there's now these people in the way. It's going to be like a Hollywood production. So I already got the team that wants to come there on that trip. So hopefully in a couple years, 2023, we're going to take the vet group and a videography group. So if anybody wants to go, here's the business card. Send an email, and I'll send it off to Alan. He'll let you know if there's room on the trip. Okay? Start saving your peanuts now. Okay? All right, thank you for coming. I appreciate it. Okay. Thanks.